So thank you all for being here tonight. We love your work and we're so excited to have a conversation with you uh, to find more about your work and yourselves as artists. So the first question is, can you all share something interesting about yourself or your work that the audience may not know? Where do we start? Um, I'll share a little bit of context about the, the video piece um, in there that might be useful. The video work in the smaller gallery there is called Montage, parentheses, it was just a dream. And it's shot from travel footage in North Korea. I visited North Korea in 2008. Um, and it's footage that I've been working with since then. I just keep revisiting it and recycling it. And, and so um, Montage really just comes out of like numerous versions of, of this video that I have. Um, and a common question that I get is if my family is North Korean. And the short answer is no. My recent, kind of recent members, members of my family and myself are from South Korea, but I also make it a point to point out that the division of North and South Korea is an arbitrary division that was made in 1945. And so my attempt in, in kind of traveling to that part of the land and the country you know, was an attempt to reconnect with um, a broader notion of ancestry and lineage that was inaccessible to me. And um, the video just really explores the, the disillusionment that comes with um, having to go through channels of tourism um, and statecraft and political ideology that um, is, has, you know, has become this kind of carnival um, when you're just trying to you know, find out a little bit about where you come from. It's, um, for me, these works here are somewhat of an attempt for me to go back to my grandma's house in Queens, in Flushing, Queens. It was the place where I just felt the happiest. We would go every Sunday and just the way my grandmother made community and family and the way she loved was so impactful that it always saddened me that the whole world didn't know her. And so, you know, here's this woman who had 11 kids, who dropped out in the eighth grade, who was a painter and went back to community college in her 60s and took a painting class and then for the rest of her life she painted on the kitchen table and so just having watched her honor who she was despite kind of what society thought she should do, what Italian American culture thought she should do, inspired me um, to walk my own path. And first it was hip hop and now it's visual art. And so these works are really about wanting to go to a museum, wanting to go to spaces that I hold dear and to see her on the wall, to see people like her, to see people you know, working class people, people who uh, I don't see very often in, on the walls in museums. More and more, you know, thanks to artists of color mostly. Um, but this is my attempt really just to try to hang out with my grandma. Um, I, my, my, my station is 179th Street, um, Hollis, Queens. And a lot of the work that was made here for the, for the show here, I made in collaboration with my mom, who surprised me and came today, with our good family friend, Agatha. So it's so lovely that they are here. And the traces of Boat Hill's movements um, are, can be visualized in the works on panel on that back wall. So that's something that may not be visible right away is sort of like how the traces or the physical movements of family might be reflected um, in an artwork. So that's some, she's here. Thank you. Well, how can I follow that? Um, I, I was thinking a lot about what Mark said. And for me, a fun fact that a lot of people don't know, all these works are about water, have water in it. And I have a deathly fear of drowning. And 
Partly it's because my dad, for the life, for his life while he was alive, used to try to teach me how to swim and it didn't take. I almost drowned like three times. So part of this thing with the sea and remembering the sea and overcoming the sea is catharsis and me like finding my own way to like control it in a sense. So fun fact. <laughs> All of you approach the concept of family, lineage, and ancestry differently within your works. Can you talk about how you do this and why these themes are important to you as artists? Great question. Um, I feel like there are certain things that continue to haunt us as artists, I mean, as human beings, but there are things that even if you think you're past it or you think you know, you, you want to move beyond it. They just keep coming back. Um, they just keep coming after you in one, one way or the other. And, and I think for me, um, this question of how do we connect with the past that feels irretrievable or feels out of reach is a question that's been haunting me in my practice. And, um, and I think over the years, uh, working with the absences themselves has been the practice, has emerged as the practice. And so working with the fragments, working with ruins, working with really whatever you're given, um, and then to make the connections yourself, um, I think is the work of what historians do. It's the work of um, any artist, and, and it's, the, it's the work of meaning making. And so, um, um, and I think through that, you know, there's something else that emerges that feels real rather than something that um, is, is constructed as, you know, being historically accurate. I don't think there's, I think we can question what history is, but I think the work that we do um, and the meaning making that we do um, to connect to certain members of our family um, is, is the, is, is the way through, it has been the way through for me. Yeah, I, f I feel like for me, I'm trying to wrap my arms around not just the journey of my family, I'm definitely trying to do that, but also just the, the journey of my people. Um, as you were saying about history, it's interesting because it seems like history, it really depends on who you ask or what book you read about it because you can find truth in all these different places. And so for me, it's about how do I tell my truth as it relates to the journey of my ancestors and my journey? How do I tell that in a way that um, allows for awarenesses that I haven't found in my family? You know, I feel like my family gave me so much wisdom but there were big pieces missing that I have had to find myself, that, that people lived their whole lifetime and weren't able to solve, like, like trauma, you know, things that, that we pass on unconsciously, right? And so how can I live my life in a way that honors where I came from while transforms a lot of the suffering and presents a body of work that can allow for conversations about our journeys to inform the choices we make now. So while I look back, I'm not, that's not what I'm doing. I'm, I'm, I'm using the journey to try to inform the present, to try to bring to the table uh, a more real, honest conversation about the choices that Italian Americans made around race, around assimilation, around class, that are fraught in so many ways. Um, I know that in my own community, the second you bring that kind of stuff up, they, people don't have the tools to conversate about it. They don't want to own kind of some of the choices that were made. So for me, it's almost like without words, I can access these kind of histories and these stories that are still living out today. Uh, when I think about the w w why and wherefore of the work that's here and connected to family, it has a lot about making the invisible visible and thinking about touch and the body, about 
Yes, cell populations in DNA and how that can be passed on and how we carry the cell populations of our grandparents and we're, how we're connected with our siblings, but then also, you know, on that level, but then also how we inform each other through touch and through um, caregiving. And so my, the three humans that I've given birth to, how um, I've shared my body with them, they're like how indelibly they are connected with me and how my body is, yes, my own, but also I loan it out all the time <laughs> and gets constantly molded and carved and touched on a daily basis. So some of it is about that too, like how our relationships are mediated through touch. Wow. For, for, for me, um, family is, I think, I'm gonna start over. I think the journey of an artist is um, to go within and the more you try to get better at your craft, the more inward you go. And for me, I hit a profound milestone when I had my son, you know, and I saw, I instantly saw my, re my replacement on the earth, you know, and he was better than me, he looks better than me, he's more suave, he's more this, he's more that, you know, because he has the, he has most of prayer in it. So, so I, so for me, it hit me like, I need to figure out like who I am, who am I? And that made me sit and reflect about my dad, you know, and then who I am, who, who, or who do I want to be? And for me, I just want my work to carry on the best of me and the joy that I try to exude all the time. Um, and try to give that to my son um, to pass it on. Um, part of my early artist statements was like, I wanted to leave like little breadcrumbs, you know, so that maybe he could look back and see it. So it's about father and son, grandfather, father, son, you know, it's that circular thing. And the bodies move and try to indicate that um, no matter what's around you, you can kind of once, once the mind is free, the body is free. And so that's my whole family thing, you know. So uh, you have each talked about your relationship with your families, um, your journey, seeking information about your lineage and your ancestry. Can you talk about your art making process and for the artwork that you guys presented here in the exhibition? Is there anything interesting that you can share about these particular works and how you came to make them? Something about my process, I, I think I would say that I'm extremely messy. Like, if the room is too neat, nothing's gonna get done. Like, I have to reach a certain level of mess where I think I'm like completely immersed in a different world. Um, and then something starts to happen. Like the work takes on its own logic. And I think it, sometimes it, it's, it takes a while to get there. It's hard to do in short increments of time when your life gets busy. Um, but yeah, I actually try to be more messy, you know, in order to like access um, um, the, the kind of environment that, that I need to be in. And so, um, when I revisited the collages in there, um, it it wasn't like something wasn't happening for a while because I was just kind of revisiting old material from collected over 20 years and and um, once you know things accumulated enough, I feel like it was starting to to direct where where um, it wanted me to go and and sometimes you forget like I forgot about that. And, and I was just like, oh, maybe this work is done. Maybe I don't have anything you know, more to say about this. But then it just, it just took a little bit of time to create more mess. <laughs> <laughs> For me, I usually have to find an image. I'm working from archival photographs on these. And I have hundreds of hundreds of them. Um, some are family, heirloom kind of stuff. A lot are from archives, but you know, I started with this one here, was the first one I made, and um, it's actually a mother and daughter who had just arrived on Ellis Island from Italy, and it's a, 
an image that was, there was a detention cell behind them because they would separate immigrants based on, I think, if certain people were sick or had certain issues, they weren't going to let them in yet. They, they, would they would categorize them. And so there was a fence behind this young daughter and mother. And for me, it's a challenge of how can I take this small digital black and white image and make it alive? How can I bring these stories to life, these souls who lived and died and there's this little tiny proof that they lived. I mean, no one else knows they lived, right? And so I want to make them larger than life. I want to, I want to amplify them, to take them to places they'd never went during their lifetimes. You know, a guy like this guy, he was building the Sixth Avenue L in, in Manhattan that no longer exists. Um, this guy was making sandwiches on New Year's Eve, and this was like in the, like right around 1950. Um, and like the woman towards over here was working the fields in southern Italy after all the men had left the town. The women were left, they had to do the, the, the farming, raise the kids, fix the houses, like the men were gone. So for me, artistically, it says these people and these stories and these souls who are now gone speak to me. How can I, how can I lift them up in a way that they sing? You know, talking about art as an inspiration, the museum, the Met specifically, was a place we went regularly and seeing the art on the wall was, it was, it gave me a reason to believe that there was goodness on the planet, mm -hmm. that there was magic here, and that art was a key venue for that. And so for me, it's like, how do I join that conversation, the art that still speaks to me? How do I make work that, that can sing with those voices? Um, when I hear the question about process, um, I so much of the work that I'm showing for the show um, is about the materiality and the process and wanting to reveal that, like make it really be really visible, not to create an image that was opaque or seemed like it just ex always existed, but that reveals itself very vulnerably that you can see how it was made or mm -hmm. um, see that a human made it yeah. in all of its sort of imperfection yeah. and fingerprints and messy, gunky stuff. Um, I have some curiosity about then using those as matrices to make other images, like what would happen if they go through the press. And so I'm also interested in that these works might have then a second life and change again. So a lot of times older work in my studio might get collaged together or painted over to turn into something else. Um, and so a lot of the works, for example, on paper have, uh, have a painting on the back of it that might glow or otherwise provide a texture so that they, they, they accrue like um, some life stuff on them, that they're crusty and um, show their making. Um, and so the process becomes really a, a part of the sort of idea behind them as well as the, you know, A to B. Oh. Um, process is an interesting question for me. Um, it ebbs and flows. Um, Right, well, f I'll speak for these works and then just talk what I usually do. Um, for these works, especially as really trying to capture freedom or elation or like triumph over circumstance, and it's an iterative process. So each time I f like this big one, so I take each figure is like reproduced in like its own small thing. I'll sketch it out because I don't want the big painting when I come to a larger piece for it to feel stiff and worked like I don't know what I'm doing. So it's a lot of practice. It's like dancing. I, I kind of see painting as a dance because it is with the body. It is with the hand. And you're using an instrument, right? I used to play music a lot. I used to practice for like six hours. So part of that is in it too. But then um, the collage elements like the um, Nigerian batik that came about from a trip to Atlanta. A collector of mine, I saw his collection, a huge collection of African art. And then I felt great affinity. I never felt such a strong affinity to the diaspora until I saw it. And I realized like 
I'm literally, maybe I'm tapping into like this kind of group mind, this kind of African sensibility. And I was talking to Lisa and saying like, the more I go a deep dive Instagram, I'm realizing like, yeah, we, we all are kind of tapping into that sense with that kind of pink, pinkish magenta. It's, kind, it's in vogue right now. You see it in Basel everywhere. So for, so for me, basically, I start with a feeling. It's feeling transports to an idea. Idea gets like broken up into a sketch or sketches. And then I probably do a small painting to kind of figure out where I'm going before. And then, and then I do a painting. What guidance or advice can you offer to students who desire to pursue art or those who are graduating this academic year? I mean, I would just say, listen to the, the voices within you, you know, it's like our own intuition for me has been my greatest guide, you know, our intuition knows, it knows things we don't, and it will tell you if you just listen and, and recognize what's coming from deep within you and what's, what's anxiety or programming, you know, so that's what I would say. My main thing for an educator is of that art studio and making, make, being a cultural producer is for, for, for you. It's that you have a place in it. And that um, when I was a student, I wish I had really thought about that more. I didn't have any illusions that I could be an artist or an art professor, because that looked like that was a fancy job for like dead white dudes. And so people with families and like complicated histories and uh, BIPOC and uh, LGBTQ plus individuals, like none of those artists were, were apparent to me. And now there's much more representation. I think that's um, more accessible knowledge, but I think it's also still, I think art studio can sometimes seem like a luxury. Whereas rather if we see it as a necessity and that you trust that you have this tacit knowledge and experience and life knowledge that you have this really important point of view that deserves to be shared and that's valid and that we need to hear it. I think that's a big thing that I th wish I had known that we have so much like, um, we can talk ourselves out of ideas or imposter syndrome. I think a big thing is even just thinking like that you deserve to be in the conversation. Well, I agree with all of them. And then, and then also say is um, for the student that's graduating, I think it's highly advisable you sit down in a quiet space for like a week, just write whatever fancy um, you want, try to pin it down where you actually visualize your life, where you want for your life, and then seek a mentor. Um, what a mentor is going to do for you is kind of concretize those kind of fan fantastical things. And then you'll be able to quickly decide, is it something you want or don't want? And I think that's the most important thing. Find somebody that kind of reflects that inner thing, you know, and see if you can talk to them, if you can get advice, and you kind of chart your way because everyone's path is different, you know. But the more examples you get, the more real it will be, the more real it is in here, the more you'll be able to actualize it. Okay, so the next question is, what is the primary takeaway that you want viewers to have from your work and this exhibition? I mean, for me, I, I, I hope that people get their own creative license, like you were saying, feel like I can join a conversation, I can say what I have to say in whatever medium that is. You know, we all have our own gifts. And so the, the world is so much better when each person is honoring their truth. And so if, if, if my work could plant seeds in people even unconsciously about, I, now I can hear that voice that's telling me I need to try this, I need to do this, or keep going with that, that would be an honor. It's a big question. I, um, there's an artist I love, Francis Elise, and um, that he has a saying that's, and I don't remember it exactly, but the gist is that um, that sometimes poetry can be political, and that the, uh, that political that politics can be poetry. For me, that's that's really salient, and that like making things and interacting, and that this can be uh, radical. 
I want to feel freedom. I want to feel joy. I want to, to, you know, go somewhere else, um, somewhere happy. I guess for me, I'll add that um, there's a lot of possibility in small fragments, um, and that um, you could make something out of little shards of, of things, and, and you can make a world from it. All right, well, let's give a round of applause for the artist. And also, Waika and Emily, who I think did a fantastic job. So, <laughs> <laughs> ourselves.